Yeah, thank you for joining us um, either on WebEx or on Facebook Live uh, to the first uh, lecture in our series. Uh, this uh, lecture series is conducted by International IDEA and friends uh, from a number of uh, Asia and the Pacific countries. This, um, this uh, lecture is um, uh, currently planned to last uh, for the remainder of this year, and it will be held every other Wednesday. So the next one will be uh, two, uh, two Wednesdays from now, um, on the 11th of October. And it's, um, it's designed to last um, about one and a half hours preceded by um, a 20 minute uh, presentation by an expert. Um, and um, the, uh, the lecture, uh, the presentation will be followed by um, a Q and A session. Now, uh, the Q and A, the, the questions um, we ask uh, participants to ask the questions through the Q and A um, uh, facility on WebEx. So those on Facebook uh, Live, um, I apologize that you will not be able to uh, ask questions unless you um, uh, log on to Facebook Live. So um, my name is um, Adi Aman. And I'm a senior program manager at IDEA's um, Asia and the Pacific uh, Regional uh, Program Office in uh, Canberra, Australia. And uh, I would like to thank uh, our panelist, um, Alan Wall, for his um, uh, time to, uh, to speak at this first lecture. I would also like to uh, thank um, international IP of friends who have um, uh, provided their inputs and also lent their hands in uh, the organization of this um, lecture. So, um, as as I've mentioned earlier, there's a there's a, a pre lecture poll um, that we conduct, uh, and it's um, uh, still open right now. So, I would encourage you to um uh, to fill uh the polling out uh, and also there will be a, a post polling uh survey our first uh, post lecture survey of our apologies um toward the end of the lecture uh, of the of the discussion session um and for quality uh purposes um there will be a um, a survey to um, uh, for us to gain your feedback on the quality of this um, uh, lecture. So please do uh, participate in all those. And uh, I should also inform you that during the discussion uh, session, there may be uh, questions uh, uh, asked uh, in the polling section. So please um, uh, uh, pay attention to those and participate. Um, so the, the poll is about to be, uh, to be closed. Um, I'd like the poll to be closed uh, at the start of, the, uh, of Alan's uh, presentation. So we still have a few minutes. Um, so before I hand the floor to Alan, uh, I'd like to introduce him, actually. So Alan, Alan Wall has over 30 years of experience in electoral administration and as a democracy advisor. From 1985 to 1994, he held various management positions with the Australian Electoral Commission. He was country director for the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFAS, in Azerbaijan in 1999-2000 in Indonesia from 2000 to 2004, Nepal 2010 to 2013, and Kosovo 
2013 to 2016. He then uh, continued as IPEL's senior elections advisor in Timor Leste in 2017 and 2018. He has been a senior electoral official for the United Nations in Eastern Slavonia in 1996 to 1997 and Nigeria in 1998 and an advisor from 1994 to 1996 to the South African government for the first democratic local government elections in South Africa. From 2005 to 2009, Mr. Wall was senior advisor to Democracy International and directed the election assistance programs in Indonesia, opinion polling in Indonesia, and research capacity development program in Timor-Leste. In 2007, he held a fellowship in electoral systems at the National Netherlands Institute of Multi-Party Democracy, or NIMD, in The Hague. Alan has also led reviews of voter registration and or election uh, management systems in Bhutan, Fiji, Iraq, Macedonia, Malawi, Mozambique, South Africa, and Ukraine. Alan, ha um, <clears throat> Alan has published widely on electoral issues, including as co-author of International Ideas Handbook on Electoral Management Design, on Electoral Systems for NIMD, on Voter Registration Systems in Africa for the Electoral Institute of Sustainable Democracy in Africa, or AISA, and as a lead author of the ACE Project's Electoral Encyclopedia in the fields of electoral management and voting operations. So, um, I would like to now uh, invite Alan uh, to um, uh, make his presentation entitled Open List Proportional Representation, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Uh, so um, we are closing the polls now and hope you uh, find the, um, the lecture beneficial. Alan? Okay, thanks, Adi. I'm going to have to try and share the screen and hope that this software works. Just Great. So just to be if people can't hear me, please let me know. My mic's on. Hopefully it's working. Um, thanks everyone for joining. This is not a lot of time to try and talk about open list proportional representation or OLPR, and I must admit a disclaimer, I didn't choose the title of this at all. And I think listening to some opinions about OLPR, a more appropriate title to some people might have been the title of the first two movies in the series, the first of which was A Fistful of Dollars, and the second of which was For a Few Dollars More, which seems to be the impression some people have of OLPR. But I sort of have a confession to make. I, I find OLPO if configured sensibly and with adequate controls on political behaviour, an arrangement that can serve very well to facilitate a wide range of electoral system objectives. Um, but first, let's get a couple of basic things out of the way. I'm not trying to teach in the English expression, people teaching your grandmother how to suck eggs, but a few things just to get out of the way. First of all, electoral systems don't determine behaviour. And a lot of the commentary I see on electoral systems seems to assume that by changing the system, you don't just change the vote to seat ratio, but you also determine how political contestants behave. And they, systems may be able to facilitate certain behaviours, but changing the electoral system doesn't necessarily solve perceived political problems. It's the attitudes of the participants, the controls on political behaviour, that are the critical issues. And secondly, that no electoral system is perfect. I mean, the system you don't have often looks a lot better than the one you do have. The issue is how well does it serve a mix of objectives rather than one particular objective. Now, open PR is described by a lot of people as a, more of a concept than an electoral system. And it's interesting to see how people do that, because usually the electoral system operates in largely the same way in all countries that use it. There may be some differences, for example, in closed list PR in the seat allocation formula or in thresholds for representation, but the mechanics are generally the same. But that's always the case with OLPR. It's used in 40 countries for either unicameral uh, parliaments or national houses. And 
at my rough count, there's more than 17 significantly different ways of implementing this concept in these 40 different countries. Most of them to do with how lists are organised, how many votes voters have and how list votes are calculated. And that's without considering issues like thresholds for candidates or lists or single or multiple tier electoral districts within an open list system. So there are almost as many variations of OLPR as there are countries that use it. Some variants are good, some don't work so well. Some have been like in Colombia pre-2003, plain ugly. But the thing about OLPR is that it can be configured to satisfy a relatively wide range of electoral system objectives, if you get it right. So what is the concept that we're talking about? The concept basically is that voters have the choice as to who represents them, and that's within a proportionally and potentially inclusive electoral outcome. Now, this fits with the increasing trend of giving voters more power over who represents them. The second part of it is that votes are pooled. Not only do voters have a choice, but votes are pooled so that seats are allocated in accordance with total votes for candidate lists. And this could be calculated in many different ways and after any representation threshold has been considered. So they're the basic things that are the same. But then there are multiple basic differences, mainly in how much power the voter has to determine which candidate's elected, whether the system is more candidate focused or um, list focused. And so some of the worst of these theories have been incredibly candidate focused like the one that used to be used in Colombia in the late 20th century, which resulted in huge numbers of single person lists, what people like Matthew Sugar have called a personal list style of election. So the concept, the voter not only has a choice of what party or list they want to support, but also which of the party's candidates. So now I come to the variations and the detail. And some of the variations are common to all PR systems and don't need really to talk about them. And district magnitude, legal thresholds for representation, and the methods of turning votes into seats. But many, and no, or rather most of the variations in OLPR are distinctive to open list PR. And these down, down to the voting method. Um, the party, or optionally a candidate, a candidate, or either a party or candidate. Then how many candidates can you vote for? And do they have to be for the same list? And can you vote against candidates as well as for candidates? Or change their order on the list? And can you do that across every party's list? And this then feeds into ballot paper design issues under how party candidate lists are shown on the ballot. Now, in most systems, you have a fairly standard way of showing your candidates on the ballot paper. But under open list, you can have many various ways. Um, how are the lists designed? Are there single or multiple party lists in the district? Can they contain both partisan and non-partisan members? Can you have independent candidates for lists? Is there a vote threshold to qualify candidates to fill seats won by the list? So instead of the highest voted candidate necessarily winning, that candidate has to have a certain proportion of the party list vote to be able to be considered to have a seat. How are votes only for a party distributed to candidates? There's at least three different ways of doing that. And how do quotas for disadvantaged groups work? And this can be difficult in open list PR compared to closed list PR. Often they need, people need to either resort to reserve seats, which has its difficulties, or a best loser formula, which we'll look at a bit later. So these variations, when you look at the 40 countries that use open list PR, you can see that the variations are really widely spread. Most common is to vote for a list and either be able to vote for a single candidate or multiple candidates within that one list. But once you get past that, you get huge variations. You get nine countries where your list total votes is made up for the total votes for candidates. And that may be for voters who voted for candidates from the one list, for multiple candidates from across lists, or multiple candidates um, across uh, lists and also be able to negatively vote for these candidates. Then you have the systems where you can either vote for a list or for a candidate, and those votes are totaled to get your list totals. And again, you've got five major variations within that. So, yep, there's lots of different variations, just purely in the voting method and, and how your list totals are calculated. So, what 
sort of issues and advantages does OLPR bring to the table? Well, firstly, it's a modern democratic reform. In the um, line with trends over the last 30 years, it A, gives the voter more influence, and B, provides a more proportional, inclusive outcome than plurality majority systems. And it can combine these two together uh, if the system parameters are right. It can provide the voter with multiple choices. So the voter can have not just one choice of who's going to represent them, but more than one. It can strengthen intra-party intra -party democracy and limit the power of executives to direct people within the party. That has, of course, an opposite to it, which it could promote party fragmentation as well. It can promote both local and proportional representation, depending on how candidates are chosen for the list and how people tend to vote for people from their own locality or from somewhere else. It does provide opportunities for independents and nonpartisan groups. We'll see this is possibly a bit overstated in a minute. And overall, it can be simpler to operate than similar systems that can try and combine these things like mixed member proportional systems. Now, talking about independence, just briefly, one of the strong advantages that people propose to OLPR is it allows independent candidates to compete equally, which isn't necessarily the case under closed list. Well, when we look at how this is distributed, there's really 13 of the, of the 40 countries don't allow any sort of non-political party list to compete. There's only seven of them that allow individual independents to compete, whereas others allow independent lists or independent candidates and lists or some sort of non-partisan groups. And when we look at the result, there's really only three countries using OLPR that have significant numbers of independents in parliament. That's Chile, Jordan and Lebanon. And this is something that many in civil society seem to think is useful to have some sort of non-partisan presence. But OLPR doesn't necessarily deliver that. Um, then what could possibly go wrong with OLPR? Well, the main thing is, and this is where it comes in for a lot of criticism, is that the external political environment has to be calibrated appropriately. Now, two really critical things are the ease of political party formation. So if you have very, very easy formation of political parties, you, and you can have particularly multiple lists from the one party competing in an election, you get the situation you have in Colombia pre-2003 with single person electoral lists. Really importantly, there need to be adequate controls on candidate funding and expenditure and particularly controls on illegal vote buying. Though, to be honest, Without these controls, any electoral system is going to be in trouble. However, because of the nature of intra-party competition in open list PR, it can be seen to exacerbate tendencies, as can plurality majority systems, to have individual candidates out trying to buy votes. There is a case that can be made that if intra-party competition does get too intense, it can lead to party fragmentation or a lack of actual influence of parties in the parliament. And this happens, say, in countries like Jordan, where you can have mixed partisan and non-partisan lists. It's likely to happen, say, even where I've been looking recently at a potential new electoral system for Afghanistan, where the incentives for independent candidates are very, very similar to those that they've had under SNTV in the past. And it may not promote what they're looking at for, which is a more cohesive party structure. One issue that you have in OLPR systems where you can have a multiple number of votes, but not a fixed number of votes. And in many OLPR systems, candidate or voters have as many votes as there are vacancies to be filled in the district. So it's a floating number. If there are five vacancies to be filled, you could have between one and five votes and have a valid vote. In other countries, again, like Kosovo, you have a fixed number of votes or up to a fixed number of votes. You could vote for one, two, three, four or five candidates. The problem here being that reconciling ballot papers becomes very, very difficult. It's not possible to reconcile the number of votes for candidates with the number of voters who have voted. And that leaves room, as it has done in countries like Kosovo in the past, for people to try and manipulate result sheets post-election. 
it can have an interesting impact on ballot paper design. Now, the issue with open list, of course, is that you have to be able to know who all the candidates are to be able to see who you're going to vote for. And if you've got particularly a large district magnitude, that can lead to huge ballot papers. So people take a number of ways of looking at this. They could try and code the candidates or they could randomly put them on the ballot paper to try and reduce the influence of political parties. So here's a few examples of ballots under OLPR. First one I don't like at all from Fiji, which basically randomly ass assigns numbers to each of the candidates. They're not in any party order. There's nothing on the either on the ballot or in the voting compartment to tell voters which party each of these candidates comes from. Voters have to know. So that weakens the sort of party consolidation that you may well need in a democracy. Similar way of doing things using numbers is from Kosovo, where you both vote for a party and can vote for up to five candidates. So you vote for a party name on the left, and then you have each of the party's candidates has a number, and you pick that number, and in each voting compartment is a list for each party of which numbers each of their candidates have. Then if you want to go for names, you get a very, very big ballot paper. This isn't the biggest. When you look at them, say, from DRC, you had 16-page ballot papers for candidates in an OLPR election. But here you can see that you can get a very large ballot if you are listing all the names of the candidates. If you have smaller district magnitude, like here in Honduras, you can have a more compact, compact ballot paper. And here, and this is one where there is panachage where you can vote across parties for candidates and where you vote for the candidate rather from the party. They've taken the view that it's easier to list the candidates horizontally rather than vertically. A fairly unusual thing of ballot paper design. But ballot paper design becomes critical in the OLPR to be establish easy links between the voter and the candidate that they want to vote for. Um, let's talk a bit about district magnitude issues because it does have an impact on this ballot paper design. There are only six countries that use OLPR that use a nationwide electoral district, and they're listed here. Everyone else uses smaller electoral districts, which, of course, smaller electoral district magnitudes, they make voter choice and ballot design a lot easier under OLPR, but their big disadvantage, of course, is they raise the natural representation threshold. So they ended up reducing proportionality, which is one of the things you're probably trying to do with a list system, and gives you more wasted votes, which are things you're trying to avoid in a list system. And to give you an indication of what sort of impact this has, if you bring the district magnitude to 15, the natural threshold for representation is around 5%. If we bring it down further to 10, it's around 7%. And if we bring it to 6, the threshold is just under 11%, estimated, not necessarily hard and fast, but these are best estimates experience. So if you do try and make the ballot paper easier for people to understand and easy to make a choice of candidate, you are likely to raise the representation threshold significantly and cut out small parties. Now, to try and get around this, some countries who have open list proportional representation have a two-tier system. They basically have districts and they have a national compensatory district, sort of like under MMP, but you have the one electoral system, open list in both national and open list in district systems, and basically the national seats being compensatory to make sure that these natural thresholds do not reduce inclusiveness in the overall parliament. Okay, what else can possibly go wrong? Ah, well, you could put limits on voter choice. You could put candidate vote thresholds in what some people call flexible OLPR. So in Croatia, for example, a candidate has to win at least 10% of the votes that the total list gets to be considered for uh, a seat. And that then if not enough candidates get this much, uh, many votes rather, then seats are allocated or the remaining seats are allocated in order on the party list, like in closed list PR. And there are other countries with lesser provisions. One thing that can happen is a public unhappiness with what we'd call leapfrogging. So in an example in, in Fiji in 2018, there were 14 ruling, ruling party candidates that were elected with fewer personal votes than 
people from opposition parties that weren't elected because of the what we call the coattail effect of high scoring candidates up the top of the list. Now, in this OLPR can have similar issues to both single transferable vote and alternative vote where the people you don't expect to win, win. But to be honest, even though you can have candidates elected here with few votes, they're not elected with zero votes as they are under closed list proportional representation. Implementation of gender and other representation quotas can be difficult, as I noted earlier. Now, they may need to rely on what we'd call a best loser, leapfrogging. Say, if you have a gender representation quota, then if insufficient women are not elected, then the least or the lowest vote meaning, the lowest vote winning men lose their seats and they're leapfrogged by the highest unelected vote winning women. Or you could have reserved minority seats. So either way, it's a bit awkward if you want to try and work representation quotas with OLPR. You can't do as you can do with CLPR and zip your list to make sure that you're going to get a certain proportion of uh, disadvantaged groups elected. Another thing that can annoy people is the use of apolitical star candidates and their coattails effect. I mean, in, in the Netherlands now, it's basically unannounced policy that the last person on every party's list is a star, star sports person, star theatre actor, whatever, to try and attract votes to that list. Though that person probably has absolutely no intention of taking a seat in Parliament um, if, if that party gets sufficient number of votes. So this can be seen as dragging people with few votes along on the coattails of candidates that have um, high visibility and high recognition. And there, it may be possible to, through lower district magnitudes, to reduce the impact of this, but uh, it may not. Then ask that the voter votes only for a party, which candidate gets the vote? Now, under some systems, no one candidates get the vote. Under others, the first on the list gets all the votes for people who vote for the party. And then under other systems, if someone votes for a party, everyone, all the candidates, pick up that vote and it gets included towards their personal vote. Now, this is something also that OLPR can be criticised for, is that which one of these you use. So a couple of common misconceptions. Um, firstly, that party nominees can't distinguish themselves by running on party platforms, but I, this to me is, is, a, is a straw person. I mean, party nominees run on their ability to implement the party platform and they can distinguish themselves quite neatly through doing that. Then this major one that OLPR facilitates vote buying. And as I noted before, this isn't a function of OLPR, it's a function of poor political finance controls. And I've yet to see a study with a control group in it. So something that shows CLPR and OLPR at the same time in the same country to indicate whether um, OLPR actually results in higher um, vote buying incidences. Now, it may be over time or compared across countries, but that's not a really scientific way of comparison. Um, it's also said that it can weaken parties as aggregators of opinion. But this also can be controlled through policy making, through internal party democracy, and also the way in which candidate selection processes um, can be implemented so that you select the candidates that are actually going to push the party policies. Okay, very, very quickly, because I'm running out of time. Um, these are some countries where OLPR has been relatively recently introduced or modified. And the notes say in some places like Honduras, Panishas have been introduced now. In most of these places, the idea of OLPR has been to increase voter choice. And that has been seen as the most important priority objective for the electoral system. And as we noted earlier, electoral systems have to um, satisfy a mix of objectives and people have to basically identify, because many of them are contradictory, which is the one that's most important to them. So in these instances, it's been introduced as an increase in voter choice. Okay, I'm at about the end of this now, so I think I'll get within time. Summary. It's OLPR can be seen more of an electoral concept with multiple variants rather than a, a rigid electoral system, something that you can play around with to get the best the mix of components for your particular environment. Secondly, 
none of these variants is perfect, but then neither is any electoral system. Third, with you, a carefully calibrated framework for OLPR, you can put into a simple package both voter influence and proportionality, if that's what you're looking for in your electoral outcomes. And it's the simplest way probably of doing that. It's a flexible electoral concept. You can, can't reinforce this enough. You can be, configure it for specific objectives. It can be wrongly blamed for non-system factors that could be present no matter what the electoral system. And it does need to be configured carefully to maximise its positive impact. So like any electoral system, it has advantages, disadvantages. I tend to see that it's more uh, can be attuned to the good than the ugly, but there certainly have been some ugly variants of it in existence over the past 20 years. Okay, thanks very much for listening. I don't want to talk anymore. This is about you guys discussing things, like hopefully amongst yourselves. I don't want this to turn into a Q&A directed at me and Artie, but this is something really that you guys are in the field. You guys are having to deal with your electoral systems, discussing between yourselves how OLPR does or doesn't fit into your sort of environment, and if it brings advantages or the disadvantages are too great for you. Okay, thanks very much for listening. And Adi, can I hand this back over to you now, please? Sure, thank you very much, um, Alan, for, for the presentation. Um, I'm sure it's uh, insightful to, um, to everyone. Um, unfortunately, the, this uh, lecture is meant to be um, a two-way um, communication between you and the participants, um, although participants can, of course, um, uh, discuss them um, with each other through the chat function. So um, we've got a few questions um, already, Alan. Uh, the first one is from Michael Mealy. How uh -huh. might an OLPR ballot structure work in a country like Timor-Leste, which votes as a single electorate with therefore a large number of candidates. Go ahead. Hi, Michael. Uh, not all that well, as you can see. Can I, Adi? Can I pull this back to to sharing screen again? Yes, of course. Okay. Let me just. Okay. So these are the sorts of choices you have. The Fiji example where you code everyone um, and then you have something hopefully that tells people what each of those codes means. Secondly, the um, Netherlands example in the middle where you have a huge ballot paper with all the names listed on it. Um, and in Timor, that's going to be a significant number of names on a ballot paper, not as bad as DRC, but a large number. Or Kosovo variant, where you have the parties, and I would imagine, given the history in Timor, you'd still probably want to vote for a party and vote for a candidate, um, where you have the parties listed, and then you have a coded number of candidates, or coded numbers for each of the candidates in each voting compartment. Um, has has a, uh, a, a book basically that says these are the candidates and these are their codes. So you have choices, but for, as I said, for huge numbers of candidates, OLPR can be messy to get uh, both a ballot paper design that's succinct and also to have a link between the voter and the candidate established, which is why some countries go to two level OLPR and have national compensatory seats for smaller uh, and smaller electoral constituencies, both running OLPR. Adi. Yep, I'm here. Um, so, okay. So the, there's another question. Uh, sorry about this. Yeah. 
Just a second. I can't see the. Um, Eric Larson, would you mind uh, reposting your question? OK, uh, so Eric Larson asked, I appreciate the point that oil PR can allow party nominees to distinguish themselves. While PR would allow voters to say to have say both on parties and on particular party priorities. Yet in some places, especially with a single national constituency, a media parties and hence voters may see their task as voting for national leaders rather than for a representative parliament. What can be done to decrease the focus on selecting the national leader? I'm not sure that you, as long as you have dominant personalities in politics, that's a fact of life. Um, I'm not sure that you're going to be able to get away from that. It could. And you can try perhaps by um, reducing the, or making multiple electoral constituencies, in which case this dominant national leader can only win in one of those constituencies. Now, I'd, uh, one of the things I wanted to look at before here was to see if this really did have an impact. And I wasn't really able to get hold of any sufficient data to be able to see whether it did or not. And in countries, say, like Finland, even when you reduce the number of the district magnitudes and have multiple electoral districts, you still have dominant vote winners in each party. And I'm not sure that this is something you're ever going to get away from, no matter what the level of um, what the level of district is going to be under OLPR. But it probably will be significantly less if you have multiple electoral districts. Then, of course, you have your proportionality and whether you want to have some sort of overall compensation within an over within the OLPR system. Um, but certainly, say in the case of countries, say like Fiji, there's been a dominance of a particular personality for a particular party that has dragged that party's vote along on his coattails. Um, but political parties would say, I'm sorry, this is reasonable and, nat and natural. If we have a dominant personality, it's super popular, why shouldn't we be able to take advantage of that? Okay, um, next, next question is from... Um... Uh, from uh, Dean Crab, uh, would Australia benefit by moving to oil PR for its Senate, where it is virtually a closed list PR? I'm not sure everyone's going to agree it's closed list PR in the Senate in Australia. Um, uh, look, this comes down to history of things. STV is, it's, it's been taken away from its initial um, individual candidate focus and made a lot, lot more list focus through what people have called reforms over the years, which has also made it easier for voters to vote. I'm not sure that there's going to be any real advantage in Australia to move to OLPR from a system that people are now used to and seem happy with. Um, next question, um, Alan, is from Awang Ilham. Can oil PR help in reducing the incidence of MPs elected switching sides, as what happened recently in Malaysia? I'm not sure it can reduce the incidence of that. I mean, what you need is proper is is clear anti-defection laws. Um, 
I mean, in, in, you can build an anti-defection law as the Indians have into a first-past-the-post system. You can build it into an MMP system. You can build that into any electoral system. I'm not sure the electoral system is going to... Um, you can build it into closed list PR like you can in South Africa or have tried to do in South Africa in the past. But I, the, the, I think the thing here is, is the strength of the anti-defection laws rather than the electoral system itself. They can be two, two separate things. They don't necessarily have to be in lockstep with each other. Anti-defection laws can work under any sort of electoral system and cannot work under other electoral systems if they're not there. One of the things with OLPR, say compared in common with um, majority plurality systems and unlike closed list PR is that there's no question in many ways that the person has been elected on the strength of a personal vote, no matter how small that personal vote may be. Now, Venice Commission and others would say that no matter what the electoral system, there is no uh, there is no imperative vote. There is no way you should take a seat away from someone who has won it. But certainly if you have a personal vote, you have a stronger argument for retaining that seat with you, no matter what party you belong to. Um, but look, it's up to the strength of the anti-defection laws rather than the electoral system itself. Adi. Yeah. Um, from Valencia, I have a comment that uh, is, uh, Can't hear you, Adi. I'm sorry. Uh, there's a comment from Carlito Nunes. Hello, and, Carlito. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, for countries that, uh, I'm sorry, Adi, you're disappearing. So in case of, uh, he, he made a comment, in case of Timor Leste's oil PR system is good, but technically very challenging to um, the EMB, the electromagnetic body. Um, I'd also like to uh, add uh, a follow with a question from uh, Wong Chiu Fan. Uh, did the introduction of oil PR to replace FTPP or block loans in Sri Lanka? And Sorry, in Adi, I can't hear a thing. Cannot hear anything. Okay. Um, how about now? Yep, now I can. Okay. Did they, this is from uh, Wang Ching Huat. Did the Hi. introduction of OLPR to replace FPTP or block vote in Sri yeah. Lanka and yeah. AV or alternative vote in Fiji encourage intercommunal moderation? Sorry, was that, I didn't hear what the question was in that. Did the introduction of OLPR to replace first past the post or block vote in Sri Lanka and alternative vote in Fiji encourage intercommunal moderation? Um, look, Sri Lanka, I don't know Wong Chinwat, so I can't really comment on that. It's nothing I've ever had anything to do with. Fiji, um, it doesn't seem to have been much in the way of moderate parties evolving, though on the other hand, OLPR has not resulted in a coup either, um, unlike unlike the introduction of AV. So to that extent, things have moderated. But certainly there are still in Fiji very, very few parties. It hasn't seemed to encourage moderates to form their own parties. And certainly the view of many of those I talk to in Fiji are that the parties still tend to be dominated at the extremes. So to that extent, probably not. Adi. Yeah, I'm here. Good. Um, there's, there's another question. Uh, there's a question from uh, Paul Thornton Smith. How does OLPR differ from STV in terms of political culture and election results? <sighs> in terms of election results, it's probably harder for people with very small fractions of the vote to be able to get elected so that it is not as fragmentary as, as doesn't necessarily the fragmentary.
frequencies of STV. It's certainly easier for people to understand than STV can be. Um, it doesn't give the exact proportionality that some people love of STV. In terms of political culture, it does create, it does, um, depending on how STV is configured, and if it's the Irish version where everyone is sort of listed indiscriminately, indiscriminately on the ballot, it possibly doesn't have the same party um, cohesion effects as it does somewhere in Australia. Uh, parties and people can vote for parties within a supposed STV system. So politically, so party-wise, possibly not as can be not as fragmentary. Voter-wise, can be easier understandable than STV. Political culture-wise, um, it it probably has equal opportunities for candidates to compete against each other. Adi. Sorry, Adi, I didn't hear a word of that. You, you, I don't know what's happening, but you're breaking up really badly. Yeah, I'm probably too far from the mic. Ah, um, what are instances when adoption, when the adoption of OLPR gamed G A M E D the system and manage the elect the allocation of seats? It depends again on what on how you configure OLPR as to whether you can do that. If you're doing it where um, in a very complex system, something like Jordan, where you have basically few political parties, yes, it should be gained really easily. If you have it somewhere like Colombia, um, where the, your incentives were zero for vote pooling, and you're in, you're basically incentivizing people to have their own electoral list. Yes, the system was totally gamed, um, and it became something more like an SNTV system than an OLPR system. Uh, do, 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 where it's been adopted recently, I'm not sure if there are other places where it's been adopted recently where it has actually resulted in people gaming the system. Um, not in the same way as you can game the system. It's, a, it, it's not the same way of gaming as, say, under MMP, which is aiming for a similar sort of result, of both uh, having proportional and individuals being voted for, where it can be easier to game the system through splitting your vote. Um, in OLPR, you can game the system in countries where you can vote against as well as for. So if you can organise people to vote against candidates they don't like, you can game the system in that way, particularly if you can, if there is panachage available and you can vote against candidates from a party that you have absolutely no intention of voting for, as in places like Switzerland uh, or in Luxembourg. So yes, you can game it to that extent by negatively affecting other parties' candidates that you particularly don't like. Yeah, um, I, I apologize to those following uh, on Facebook. Um, uh, the uh, live feed has been interrupted um, a couple of times, so apologies for that. Um, but we try to uh, get the live stream back as soon as um, that happens. Um, so, Alan, next question is from um, Ronil Kumar. Uh, how do how how do you come to a threshold where it does not discriminate, using the term loosely? How does one come to a threshold where it does not discriminate, using the term loosely, smaller parties and independent candidates, as is the case is for Fiji? The threshold is 5%. Yeah. Because when these smaller parties don't make it to the threshold, a large number of vote is wasted, or we can say transferred to the parties that have qualified. 
Yeah, um, I'm just trying to think back to Fiji 2018. Now, I think that to, the issue to me more with Fiji is the lack of competitors. Sorry, wait till I stop sharing this screen and look for some data for a moment. Um, the, the issue to me is more with Fiji is, as I said, the fact that there are a few competitors rather than the threshold is stopping people. Um, the 5% threshold would make a difference and simulations I've run recently show that if you got rid of that, um, if you had a 0% threshold in 2018 that you would have had or depending on which allocation seat allocation system you use, the government could have either just had a one seat majority or had been in a one seat minority, depending on what seat allocation method you use. So yeah, it would would make a difference there. One of the other things you've got to think of is what are the incentives for parties to actually participate as well? Even if you have a zero threshold, what are the party registration requirements? And in Fiji, they're fairly stiff. And they're fairly stiff for reasons such as, as countries as in Indonesia to make sure that there aren't regional and fragmentary parties contesting. Um, but they are in, in Fiji. It's a very high barrier in terms of percentage of uh, voter population that a party has to reach to be able to have enough uh, supporters to be able to register the party. Independence. Um, there are very few OLPR systems, as I noted before, where significant numbers of independents get elected. And of course, they tend to be more easily elected where the threshold is lower, uh, either naturally through a big electoral district or um, through having no, no legal threshold there. But hey, the Fiji situation, the getting rid of the threshold would make a difference. If you had a zero percent threshold, you would have had more parties represented in parliament. And I'm just still trying to find where my data is on this because it's not it's not coming up. Um, da, 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 because I just worked on this. <sighs> Okay, so with a zero percent threshold, um, no, no threshold wouldn't have even having no threshold would not have helped Hope or Fiji Labor get a seat, but you would have increased the seats to four parties with a zero threshold and using some form of St. Larg or a largest remainder method of allocating the seats. So yes, that could have had, um, you would have had Unity Fiji with a seat and you would have had a, a, an extra seat to the National Federation Party. Um, so yes, it would, would have made a difference in Fiji. But thresholds are there, I mean, often thresholds are there as they are in places like Timor-Leste to try and help party consolidation and stop party fragmentation. And it's a deliberate attempt on the part of the system to limit the influence of small or independence in the parliament. Now, that's a rational system objective. It depends on whether that is the objective of the, of the majority of the people who make decisions on what the electoral system is going to be. Um, there are arguments you can make for consolidating parties uh, or for forcing small parties into coalitions so that they have a better chance of winning seats. And thresholds are one way of doing that. On the other hand, if your objective is to have as many different voices as possible represented in the parliament, having a zero threshold, and most countries, or the majority of countries using OLPR have a zero threshold, that is the way to go. So Carlito followed uh, with another comment that yeah. um, in, in countries like Timor-Leste where the older generation and charismatic leaders are still in politics, they would like to maintain closed list PR system because it would give them more power in the politics as they decide who will be on the list. Do you have yeah. any comment on that? Well, <clears throat> there's two different issues I think here. One is well, there's, there's three. One is what sort of OLPR system do you have? 
do you have where the one voter has total control and votes for the candidate only and those candidate votes are pooled to make the candidate lists. In that case, you move to OLPR and the party leaders can lose control because while they can determine who is on the voter on the candidate list, they can't determine who people votes for, who people vote for. But the majority of OLPR systems still have allow for a vote for a party. And while you do that, you can still buy uh, in, if you have either candidate thresholds or even where, where you put parties or candidates on the list, you can have some control over who people vote for. Um, oh, I don't have data, but being up the top of the list, and this is why places like Fiji have random order of candidates to try and break this up, is if you're up the top of the list, it is worth a small percentage of the vote to you, the people voting for the candidate who is at the top of the list. So yeah, CLPR does maintain party control over who gets elected, but there's varying degrees of party control that can be exerted over different forms of OLPR system as well. Um, to uh, Sham Raju, I think um, Alan has uh, addressed the question on uh, independent candidates in OLPR. Uh, but if you are not, uh, if you have a follow up question, uh, feel free to um, write it down. Uh, next question, Alan, is from uh, Yolanda Panjaitan. Are there indications that an implementation of any variations of OLPR is better suited in a parliamentary or a presidential system of government? <clears throat> Don't know. Haven't looked. I'm sorry. Um... I'll have a look at that, but that's not something I've ever looked at. Okay. So I'd be, uh -huh. I'd be totally talking off, as we would say in my country, talking off the top of my head or talking through my ass or whatever. So I'd rather leave that. And if you don't mind, I'll have a look at that and get back to you. Okay. So that's sparked uh, Yolanda. Um, next question is Eric Larson again. To what extent? Are intra-party debates made explicit in OLPR? For example, are there good examples in OLPR systems of candidates advocating for particularly legislative priorities? Mm, again, I don't know. Sorry, not something I've looked at. So I, I, and I'm not sure there's going to be any data. Certainly in the countries I've worked when we have used OLPR, that hasn't really been all that evident. Um, so no, it's not not something I, I have an opinion on. Sorry, Adi. Yep. No, no. Right. So um, that's um, any any more questions? That's it. Uh, that's all I can see here. What one of the things to do with thresholds that I was looking at recently that I found interesting is that there's no real correlation between percentage threshold and the number of parties in parliament, which I found quite interesting. <laughs> that the the vote that thresholds don't seem to be a determinant of vote spread. Uh, we have there, we, there are countries with zero percent thresholds with few parties in parliament, and people countries with five percent thresholds with say like Algeria with twenty two parties in parliament. So thresholds doesn't really uh, don't really it's, determine it's, how many it's, parties. It's, it can not be a direct correlation. Okay. Adi, I've lost you.
Hello? Okay. Sorry, the uh, uh, internet connection was uh, intermittent, so it disappeared for some time. Um, so how about, um, I know, uh, okay, there are more questions now uh, from Wang Chin Huat. Alan, you list vote buying as non-system weakness. You list okay. vote buying as a non-system weakness. Non what would you consider as weakness? Weakness. So, so vote buying <laughs> as a non-system yeah. weakness. Yeah, yeah. What, what would you consider as systematic errors? In in OLPR, as issues that are systematic. Am I is that have I got that collect? Well, I understood that correctly, Adi. What would you consider as systematic errors? In what? So, in, so, in OLPR. In OLPR, yes. Yeah. Well, the or major OLPR. issue. Is, yeah, the major issues are things like party fragmentation, ensuring electoral integrity, and the whole issue of connecting voters and candidates and doing that effectively. Uh, through ballot paper design, the three potential big weaknesses in OLPR. And they're, they're, they're inherent in, in the system, and you can mitigate them through design functions, but you, you, all, you, know, you have to have fairly interesting workarounds to do it. The other um, system weakness is the inability to in some what some people would say fairly implement um, quotas for disadvantaged people, and that also is a weakness within the system. That to get representation quotas to work, you have to bounce out people who who have actually won enough votes to be elected. So there are four four fairly significant system weaknesses. But then every electoral system has weaknesses. You pick your weakness and you pick your strengths as to which ones are more important to you. No, there's no perfect electoral system, is there? Well, there's a... uh, there's no. What what amuses me is the fact that the electoral system you don't have is so often better than the one you do have, mainly for the fact that it's different now. I love, I mean, Afghanistan and Iraq at the moment are really fascinating. Afghanistan with SNTV looking to move to a fairly mild version or fairly weak version of OLPR to empower parties because parties don't have enough power. Next door in Iraq, they're thinking of moving from PR to a majoritarian system because they don't like the fact that parties have power and they're trying to break that. So whatever you don't have is is always better for you. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Titi Angraini. Yep. Of electoral justice scheme we can offer, can we offer to reduce the vote buying phenomena? For example, in Indonesia, vote buying becomes a big enemy of OLPR. Yeah, but there's no, it's a big enemy of OLPR because there aren't any restraints on people buying votes. No one ever gets punished for it. That's not a matter of an electoral justice system. That's a matter of the willingness to actually take punitive measures against those who conduct vote buying. Um, it's again, it's a political culture weakness. It's a, it's a political will weakness rather than a system weakness. Um, I'm not sure you could have any number of systems and it wouldn't make any difference if there wasn't the intention to actually implement the penalties. And Nepal has a similar issue and that, that it has a really strong codes of conduct on everyone. It says this monster code of conduct for everyone who has anything to do with elections, but the problem is actually enforcing it. Um, and as long as there isn't the enforcement there, it doesn't matter what system in place you have to control it. So enforcement is key. Enforcement um, is key. Yep. Um, and enforcement is not just 
is political will plus enforcement mechanism, not just enforcement mechanism. Okay, uh, Mercedes Robert has a question. Um, how would you compare in terms of the election of women between open list and closed list? Well, as I just said, it's a lot, lot harder under open list because it's much, much harder to be able to implement quotas under uh, quotas for representation under open list or even well. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Under both open list and closed list, you can have quotas for candidacy. And under both open and closed list, you can require zipped candidate lists. However, whereas under closed list, that will result definitely in a number of women getting elected. Under open list, it depends which of those women people will actually vote for. So it, it can, um, so there's that problem with candidacy. Uh, it can mean that women have to have incentives to be able to campaign, uh, either more state funding to be able, because we all know that it is, women have difficulties in raising funds for campaigning um, or other um, assistive measures for their campaigns. In terms of representation, it's a, another double whammy or double barrier there in that if you, it's harder to put a candidate or sorry, a representation quota on open list PR without upsetting the will of the voter. The voters have said, these are the orders that we have voted for candidates. So hang on, there's not 30% women there. What do we do about it? We get rid of men that have been voted for and replace them with women who have not been voted, who have not received as many votes, if you want to have a representation quota. Or you have a reserve a section of reserved seats for women, which I'm not really in favour of, um, that can re produce second more second class representatives. Um, my experience also, which was under OLPR, is that and had a quota system for women, and it had a best loser system. In the first couple of elections, few women got elected in their own right. By the third election, over 50% of the women who were elected were elected through the number of votes they received. And this has been increasing. So the quota was actually, even though it was a best loser quota, was leading to women being able to show that they could perform as parliamentarians and leading to them, more of them, receiving sufficient votes to be elected in their own right under OLPR. But yeah, dealing with disadvantaged groups and minorities is harder under OLPR than closed list. And again, it's something you trade off with a voter choice or assuredness of disadvantaged group representation. Adi. Hello. Yeah. yeah. It, it took some time to unmute. Sorry. Um, okay. To unmute. okay. Wang Chin Wat has another question. Uh, Wang Chin Wat has too many hard questions. Well, he's got a lot on his mind about this. Yeah. In comparison <laughs> to FPTP and CLPR. Yeah. How far does OLPR or which of its variants encourage policy-based parties, or in other words, programmatic parties? Hmm. We're going to stop, I'm going to stop Chin Wat asking hard questions. Again, I'm not sure that the system itself does that as, as much as the, the attitudes of the people who are in the political parties. Um, <coughs> CLPR can, because it's a unified party, because can possibly be better at encouraging policy-based parties. Because you have individual competition within an OLPR system, and similarly as you have within FPTP, you can have more of a personality-based politics if that is the culture within the country. And yeah, that can be another weakness within it. And that leads again to this issue of fragmenting of ideas within a political party under OLPR. Um, that can, said, can be mitigated by the way in which you develop policy within the party as to how much um, IPD there is in actually developing policy positions and in selecting the candidates. 
But yes, it can encourage a more personality based rather than a policy based um, thing or a based environment because it's up to each individual candidate in some OLPR systems to garner the votes. Now, in systems where you vote for a party and then may vote for a candidate, that tendency is likely to be less because it is a still a fairly list and party based system with the option then of voting for a candidate. That is, is likely to be exacerbated, this um, personality based um, competition, where all you vote for, all the voter votes for, is the candidate, does not vote for a party at all. So, yeah, on the variant which you vote for a candidate only, it can be less encouraging of, of strict party policy and de development. On the variants that you vote for a party and then optionally vote for a candidate, it may be very, very similar to CLPR and the way the parties operate in trying to get votes for themselves as a, as a policy based organisation rather than for their individual candidates. Okay, uh, Michael Maley's got um, uh, a couple of more questions as well. You haven't discussed counting very much, especially counting at the polling places. How can that work under OLPR? where voting is both for parties and candidates. I'm not sure there's going to be any difference with under CLPR. You need to amalgamate all the votes for an electoral district before you can do anything about striking a result. Um, certainly, oh, well, there are a number of oh, well, many OLPR systems vote at the, at the polling place level and then amalgamate to constituency or amalgamate to nationally to be able to do it. There's nothing to stop you counting at the polling place level. The issue, as I said before, is, is an issue where you have multiple votes and where you have votes, particularly if you have panachage and how you actually reconcile your votes at any level to make sure that the results are a, a fair and accurate result of how the voters have actually voted. And that's close to impossible. And that, that's another, which I forgot to mention or may not have mentioned before, is a, another weakness with the system, is if you can have multiple votes, how you assure election integrity. But under OLPR, it's, it's normal to count at the polling place level. Uh, Michael's next question is, uh, what would be the challenges of implementing OLPR against the background of a COVID-19 like pandemic? Um, again, something I haven't thought about specifically in terms of OLPR, Michael, and you've done a lot more work on this than I a lot more looking at OLP or anything in COVID than I have, which is basically zero. Um, it has, uh, in terms of voting, um, yeah. In terms, in terms of the actual voting process, it's going to be similar. Um, it's going to be more difficult in some ways for parties to be able for candidates to be able to campaign for themselves as against getting a party policy message across say the CLPR versus OLPR for candidates in their entirety to be able to get through to electors is going to be more difficult so the voters choice might not be as informed between candidates in a COVID-19 situation um, in terms of ballot papers um, it might, in fact, be easier in some ways to have remote voting on a ballot paper than for OLPR, if it's a large one, than actually having to do it um, in person in the polling place in a hurry with more time to be able to make up a decision as to which of the candidates you want to vote for. And um, in terms of counting, um, it's still the issues are still going to be the same in terms of bringing ballot papers or bringing results together to be able to determine election results. Uh, 
No, campaigning and also in terms of completing ballot papers, I can see differences, but on the top of my head, and to be different from any other electoral system in a COVID-19 environment. Right. Um, uh, Dahlia Umar has a question. Do you have best examples of countries whose election system is OLPR and are using electronic voting or electronic counting? Um, she's asking because e-voting and e-counting may be a way to reduce elect or potential election fraud in a PR system, yeah. uh, especially OLPR, because of its counting and recapitulation complexity. Yeah, Estonia probably. Just want to encourage people to look at. Uh, do you have um, any examples? Good. Yeah, I said Estonia. Estonia, yeah. They probably got more. Um, they probably have more experience with it, and I think they're probably more confident that they ought to be about their electronic and i-voting system. But it's probably the, the major example of of e-voting and um, an OLPR in the world. There's lots of materials on it on the Estonian Electoral Commission site. Now, they were going to do it in Finland, but they delayed it due to security. And I think it's still delayed due to uh, security concerns. But that was going to be the second big one uh, in that part of the world using e-voting and open list. Okay. Um, Courage, if you're looking, I'd encourage looking at the um, at, at the uh, Estonian example. Okay. okay. The other places that use it are Brazil, um, which has also had relatively um, good experiences with electronic voting, uh, mainly because they introduced it gradually. That's probably the uh, the most Im important one. Uh, there are people who use open list who've stopped it, like Netherlands, or never got of um, who were using it before and didn't use it. Um, there were people who looked into it, like Norway, and haven't really taken it up. Who use open list. But yeah, Estonia is probably the major example. Um, the other place is Switzerland as well, whereas in some cantons, um, there have been tests of using internet-based voting also. But yeah, Estonia is the main example of, of OLPR and i-voting, and also Brazil and terminal-based e-voting. Alan, um, <clears throat> we are almost at, at the end of time, but I'd like you to ask. I'd like to ask you a question. Um, it's probably not uh, directly related to LPR, but to um, a, a list proportional representation systems in uh, in general. Um, so, in terms of formula, um, do do different formulas truly uh, can be truly um, can can truly determine the number of parties getting elected in parliament into parliament. Assuming there are no thresholds. Assuming there are no thresholds. Yeah. Okay, can I read out can I share a screen with you again? Just let me see if I can sure, sure. This. and I'll show you an example of how they make a difference. Um now I've got to work out how to share a screen again. <laughs> share application. I want to share Excel. Which one do I want to? Have you got an Excel spreadsheet that says 2018 Fiji election data there? Yes. Okay, so if we look at this, the way in which DONT is applied in Fiji, you get a split 
Oh, this is using 2018 election results. The way in which DONT is currently used there, you get a split of 27, 21, and 3. Current system between the parties. If on those same votes are used, the early version that was used in Italy, I get the same. If I use a basic... Uh, sorry, Alan. Alan, can you uh, zoom in, please? Can I zoom in? Yeah, uh, yeah. Make the numbers larger, yeah. Yeah, hang on. I've got a problem that my... Yeah, I've got it. It's hidden. Whoops. Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's try this. Is that better? Yes. Okay. It's about as big as I can make it. So, under Don't, as is used in Fiji, you have this 27-21-3 split. Using the same figures under Imperiali, you get a 27-21-3 split. Using a basic St. Larg method, you get a 26-24-1 and one split, which you also get under modified St. Larg, and you also get under the, as done in Sweden and also as done in Denmark. There is a, another version, a rather weird version of St. Larg used in the early 20th century in parts of Scandinavia, where you would get on these same votes a 25-21 for one split. And then uh, there's another version that has been used for internal elections where you go back to 24 and 1. And I just remainder methods for group and hair quotas give you the same results. Um, the 26, 24, and 1, and the Hagenbach Bischoff gives you a slightly different version, uh, 26, 21, 4. So, yes, on that same set of votes with no threshold, you can come up with a number of election results, with Dont being the one that is more um, favourable to larger parties. And probably the this weird version of St. Lar used early in early 20th century Scandinavia comes up with a version more conducive to smaller parties or less large parties, medium and smaller parties. So yeah, it can make a difference. Now my contention usually is that the election, the seat allocation method probably is not is generally, and it depends on vote distributions, it's generally not as important as getting rid of thresholds if you want to increase the number of parties represented. For example, if I put a 3% threshold on this same set of data, uh, sorry, let me, I went to the wrong sheet. If I use a 3% threshold, we're still getting a little bit more compressed. We're not getting this last party, the Unity Fiji Party picking up any seats as long as you have a 3% threshold, no matter what seat allocation method you use. If you retain a 5% threshold, again, it's not making any difference. Uh, you, you're basically restricted to the three parties, no matter which of the seat allocation methods you use on this particular vote distribution. So the threshold is important. But when you've got zero threshold, certainly, and seat on vote distributions like this, it can make a significant difference into, well, was, yes, a significant difference as to how many seats parties win. That makes sense, Adi? Yes, uh, it does. I mean, and it doesn't seem to show much difference, Alan. It's a small, relatively small number of seats, and it's a very skewed vote distribution towards the two biggest parties. Right. right? Now, the, right. it would have a bigger difference if the vote distribution was not as heavy. Uh oh, okay. So when you look at here, the three smallest parties here, 10, 13, uh, 450 um, have got less than 3% of the vote between them. Right, right. right. So if you even that distribution out, yeah, I mean, the seat allocation formula will 
react differently depending on your vote distributions. And I yep. don't have one handy here with a more to show you. Well, well, I do have one, but it'll take me a few minutes to find it. No worries, no worries. Okay, um, thank you very much, Alan. Um, there have been um, a whole lot of questions. Um, it's been nonstop for, for about an hour. Um, some of which I could answer properly, some of which I think I've skated over the surface of. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's um, there, there's a there's a question that you parked as well from the question, Yolanda. The question yeah. that I batted away that I'll have to I'll have to think about. <laughs> but I, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah. So to um, uh, thank you very much once again, Alan, for your um, time and your willingness to participate at this first lecture. Um, and uh, uh, to participants, there is a, um, a post. Uh, lecture uh, poll open at the moment. Uh, please do participate. Um, uh, for those who did the first one, the, the pre one, yes, the questions are the same. So uh, what we're looking at is uh, whether or not there's been a change in your uh, uh, views and understanding uh, before and after the lecture. Um, and after the, uh, the, the event is ended, you will also see a post um, event survey. Uh, this is where we ask um, uh, to you about uh, feedback uh, on how uh, we did today. Uh, so apologies, and this is our first time, so apologies for some uh, technical glitches um, uh, that happened. Um, and also to Facebook viewers, uh, apologies for having um, uh, cut off uh, twice, uh, but it's been uh, it's been going on for uh, uh, quite well for the last thirty minutes, so that's good uh, news. Um, and yeah, so um, thank you very much uh, for your participation. And um, our next uh, lecture will be on the 14th of October, same time. Um, so wherever you are, uh, please mark your time. Um, the topic is how does distant and online election campaigning affect political freedoms? So we all know that um, in, uh, in the COVID era, uh, campaigning is, um, is um, having to resort to uh, social distancing and therefore also online campaigns. So uh, we're looking at how, how does that affect political freedoms in terms of the uh, candidates, the political parties and campaigning, how, how does that affect the freedom? So um, uh, thank, you, thank you once again for your participation and looking forward to uh, your participation uh, at next time. And um, thank you uh, once again to International Ideas Friends. Um, um, and uh, if, if any institutions who would like to um, uh, join uh, the Circle of Friends, uh, please uh, let us know. Uh, we, are, we are open and uh, for the next lectures, uh, if you find this useful, please uh, join in and also let others uh, know in your network of this lecture and encourage them to participate. Thank you and until uh, next time, bye-bye.